Hi everybody, uh, welcome to the Open Knowledge Australia mini-conf, our first mini-conf at LCA. Um, it's going to be awesome. Uh, so, I'm Matt, um, I'm one of the um, Open Knowledge ambassadors in Melbourne. Um, I'm also a computer scientist, I do Linux sysadmin type stuff and development. Uh, until Friday, I worked for a small company called CyberIT in Melbourne. Uh, and now I'm fun employed, which is going to be awesome for a little while. Um, I'm also a scout leader. I uh, am enthusiastic about mapping, um, and I really like privacy and security as well. Uh, so who are Open Knowledge? Um, Open Knowledge is an international organisation, uh, and Melbourne has uh, sorry, Australia has a chapter of Open Knowledge. Um, and so here's our awesome logo and our web page. And sorry, I am a page behind. What's going on here? There we go. All right, cool. There is our, our logo and all, the all that jazz. Um, yeah, so stuff that we do, we deal with open source software, open hardware, open government, open data. Anything that's open, we deal with it in some way, shape, or form, whether it's you know, dealing, talking to governments or um, liaising with researchers or you know, particularly around networking between people. Um, so we do all that kind of fun stuff. We help out, but are not the primary organisers of GovHack. Um, Open Knowledge Melbourne, in particular, us are usually the people who run the, that GovHack site. Uh, for those who don't know, GovHack is a hackathon that um, where the government publishes open data and says, "Here, have at it. Go and do some cool stuff with it." So um, we ha that's a weekend event, and a lot of cool stuff happens out of that. I won't go into the, all, all the detail um, because I haven't got a lot of time. Uh, what else do we do? Uh, we also run Health Hack, which is another hackathon that we do where uh, researchers come to us with problems that, like, non-technical researchers come to us with uh, usually medical problems that they want uh, re help researching. Uh, and we do things like help them with um, using R to do statistical analysis or uh, to use, use map, OpenStreetMap or other mapping tools to, to map geographical information or um, or write software to help uh, eliminate failed um, gene mutations or whatever. Uh, and often out of that we'll get a viable product that can be used at the end of the weekend and save researchers like several hours a week, um, which is totally awesome. Um, we also, in Melbourne, we run a weekly meetup. Um, here's our meetup information uh, where we do a whole lot of stuff. Uh, where we've kind of put together a program for this year. Um, we haven't published it yet, but we're, we're getting there. Uh, but some of the stuff that we do, we do a Meet the Data Owners session where we'll have um, somebody from, I don't know, Vic Rhodes come and show us their cool um, data that they published on road quality or you know, whatever. Um, we have people come to demonstrate software tools. Uh, we run tutorials and workshops. Um, we sometimes have a shut up and hack session where we'll say, all right, well, let's find a cool project and do some work on it. You know, um, Maybe try and refine some of this data that we've found online or whatever. Uh, and also we have occasionally uh, community drinks sessions where we'll just have people from all over, the, all over the community kind of come and have a chat and we'll kind of have a, a session where we say, all right, each person give us your name, give us your superpower, you know, the thing that you're good at and um, something that you're looking for and hopefully we can make a whole lot of connections there where people can find out you know, other people who can help them with their problems. Um, so the schedule for today, um, we've got the Miniconf open, which is, which is me. Um, I've also slotted in, in a couple of minutes, uh, Steve Bennett, who is another Open Knowledge ambassador for Melbourne. Um, he was able to make it today. It was a little bit of touch and go, but this is all cool. Uh, so he's going to come and talk to you in a minute about, I assume, Open Council data -y stuff. Cool. Uh, and then we've got uh, Lily Ryan at 11.05. Um, We've got Paris over here at 11.30, and then we've got lunch. And then after lunch, uh, we've got Ridwin talking about open information, um, Dan talking about open gov uh, prying open government, uh, VM, who's not here yet, um, but I'll talk to her later, uh, talking about the Internet Archive, which I'm really looking forward to. That sounds like an awesome talk. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we've got Fred over here talking about um, demography. And then after, after that, at about half past four, I haven't got anything planned. But I'll either do, we might maybe do a lightning talk, or I might uh, do a talk that I've done before on OpenStreetMap, or we'll, we'll just see how that works as the day progresses. Um, so I think that I will get out of your way. Ah, before I finish up, um, 
I'd just like to remind everybody that um, there is a code of conduct for uh, LCA, which applies both to speakers and delegates, so please make sure that you've looked at that and are adhering to that. Uh, other than that, today I think, I think today's going to be awesome, so I will um, introduce Steve Bennett. Does it go full screen? Yeah, it probably does. Like that. Um, let's try that one. That looks about as full screen as it's going to go. Take awesome. That. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Steve Bennett. I'm an organizer with Open Knowledge. Uh, my day job is working at Data61, uh, working on National Map. Um, I sort of have to put that up so I have permission to be here. Um, Okay, so the story I'm telling today is about open council data, the thing that motivates this um, com compared to other sorts of open data, particularly, say, federal data. Uh, the federal level, you have one source of information. Um, you know, a department can put out a, a data set and that covers uh, the whole country. With councils, though, we have 500 councils in Australia, 79 in Victoria and all of them think they are utterly unique and the first council in the world to think of putting online a bin map um, showing you which night of the week your garbage will be collected. Um, they think they're the first people to uh, put a dog walking map or a community directory. And if you think I'm kidding, here's just four or five uh, examples. They were literally just the first four councils I went to. Those are all waste collection maps and they all look completely different. And that's a lot of wasted effort um, being sort of basically replicated 500 times around the country. And it kind of seems dumb um, the one on the bottom left is Geelong. Um, so what if we used open data to save ourselves a lot of effort and actually have a better experience at the end of the day? Uh, so put out some good um, data in a standard format so that app developers can use it and make something interesting that they can maybe sell. Uh, the public could have a better, easy way to remember whether it's been night or not. Um, you might think it's easy to remember whether it's been night. In a lot of council areas, there's an alternating uh, recycling or green waste uh, night. So you might know that Wednesday is your bin night, but is it recycling or is it green waste? Um, and you might have that down pat, but then one night you're traveling to a friend's house or your house sitting or something. Um, do you know? Do you know what council you're in? Do you know where to find out the information? What if there was like one place you could go? Or what if your, your bin app uh, worked no matter where you were? Um, and councils are actually pretty motivated to have people remember when their bin night is because they spend money picking up um, the missed collections. Tell me, streaming right? This could never work, um, but actually, it does work, um, and it's been really successful so far. Uh, Fifteen Victorian councils are publishing open data. Uh, we sort of started in Melbourne. Geelong, Ballarat, kind of the big ones, but lots of others have gotten on board, like Colac, Otway, Otway Shire, Glenelg Shire, Cardinia, Casey, um, even Alpine Shire. It's not just Victoria. Uh, the one on the left are lots of councils around Adelaide publishing open data, and up there is Brisbane. Uh, so some of the Brisbane councils are publishing open data now. Although there is almost nothing in New South Wales, nothing in Western Australia, um, and there are a couple of councils in Tasmania that are putting out open data. Um, this is what it looks like when councils publish data. You can go to data.gov.au and you search for garbage and look at all those beautiful, homogenous, um, almost standardised uh, data sets being put out. Um, Hobson Bay Garbage Collection Zones, Surf Coast Shire Garbage Collection, uh, which are sort of more or less in the same format. So why don't we make an app? Yes, why don't we make openbinmap.org, which is a real thing. And if I'm lucky, I can switch to another tab and I can show you totally for real. But it's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> there we go. Cool. So this is openbinmap. And let's say that we live, I don't know, down here in Geelong, we walked here. Well, it's telling us that the rubbish is going to be collected every second Tuesday, so we can relax because bin night is six days away. In fact, when you open the site, it looks up your current location, um, and so you don't even need to click anywhere. 
Um, if you happen to live in one of these other places that are red, then it tells us Tuesday night um, is bin night. Oh, sorry, uh, yes, Tuesday night is, is bin night where I just clicked. Um, so we need to put out our household waste, which has a red lid bin apparently. It's 120 liters, that one. And we also need to put out our green waste. But I'm guessing one of these other areas. All right, so that one's a rubbish bin with a recycling bin. And you know what's interesting? Uh, I thought I was clicking up in another suburb of Geelong, but it turns out I actually just clicked in uh, somewhere that's actually in Golden Plain Shire. And it was totally seamless and we got, like, it worked just fine across council boundaries. And up here, this is actually like a Ballarat suburb and these are um, suburbs of Hobson's Bay, Melbourne and so on. So the dream is actually coming true. It actually works. So isn't that cool? So maybe this is not that smooth going back and forth between the live and the can demo. Cool. Um, I think I need to update, I think we're more like 14 or 15 councils now. Uh, and there's a few interstate ones as well. So how do we make that work? Obviously, if you just tell councils, put out your rubbish collection uh, data, then they will do it in 79 different formats in Victoria or in 500 different formats in around Australia and that's exactly what was happening. So a couple of us got together and decided to try and this problem in the bud and come up with some standards. Um, they are lightweight open standards, which is another way of saying that I just kind of made them up, put them on the web and told people to follow them. And surprisingly, they're actually pretty receptive to that. Um, standards are often, especially in geospatial standards, can be really heavyweight and have like long committee processes and it's like five years then eventually it's like an ISO certified solution to a problem that doesn't exist anymore. Um, so this was more like, you know, an hour or two. Um, and we've got lots, so we've got, you know, trees, we've got parking zones, garbage collection zones, dog walking zones, and there's tagging and, you know, all kinds of, um, basically just spells out all the, the different fields that you should use. And so having solved the problem of garbage bins, um, how about trees? It turns out that lots of councils have tree inventories. So in addition to sort of planting and maintaining all the trees around their, uh, the camp, did my microphone stop? Um, that they actually maintain the data about all those trees. So they pay audit, um, so they pay uh, arborist companies to go around audit all the trees and they produce a data set and some of those councils have started publishing them and they're pretty interesting, um, not just for researchers, um, but also you know, for, for councils to be able to learn from each other. And even people like members of the general public like me, I did not care at all about trees and then I started learning more about them and I built opentrees.org, which brings together all the different tree inventories from uh, different councils that have published them. And pretty much no one had really done this before. Uh, each council kind of collected its own data but never really looked at other councils and then now you've got this thing that lets you click on a tree in, in any old council and it'll give you a bunch of metadata about it. So for example here uh, I've clicked on a Melaleuca quinquinervia and that particular tree that I've clicked on is two to five meters tall. The information was captured sometime in 2012 and there are 140 other trees of that species across the uh, the amalgamated uh, data set. And not only that, uh, when you click on one, it looks up the species in Wikipedia, it gives you a little sort of synopsis of what the tree is about, gives you a photo, obviously not the actual tree, but you know, some other substitute tree that's similar enough. Um, and it does a couple of cute things, like it shows you how interesting the tree is. Uh, so when you zoom in, um, if, if a tree is so interesting there's only say 25 of them in the whole database, then you get like a sort of a yellow color. And if it's really interesting, like five trees of, of that type or fewer, then it goes red. And also it shows you with these little blue markers all the other trees of that, uh, of that species. Am I gonna attempt fate and do the, the live demo thing? I'll close the windows, how about that? There we go, there's open trees, hello. Hey, I'm, I'm an open tree. Uh, sure, let's share our location. So if we go outside, then we can see uh, some of these trees on the street around us and if we, 
hover over that one. That one is a Pinoke Quercus palustris, and it is semi-mature, and it is in good health, and has a fine structure. And there are 2,390 similar trees. In fact, all the trees along here seem to be the same variety. Um, but if we pan around a little bit, then we can maybe find uh, a more interesting tree. Oh, see down here? Much more interesting trees. So, if anyone's after a spear lily, a Dorianthus palmeri, there are only two of those in the whole database. And one of them is right there, you know, only 100 meters away or so. Um, and it's expected to live for another 10 or 20 years from now. So, no rush. <laughs> um, but it, it's a, a really fascinating thing. Like you don't think of trees as necessarily inherently interesting, and then you start to, I don't know, you sort of float around, and you're like, is that what that tree is called, that one that I see all the time, the prickly leaf paperback? Uh, I was quite interested to discover that uh, a tree that, um, there was one on uh, outside the front of my house where I was growing up, turned out to be, I wonder if I can find one, um, a super, super common tree, and its name is Lophostomon confertus. Of course, oh, there, there was one, the brush box. Uh, also known as the Queensland box. So if you've ever seen a tree like that, that is the number one most common street tree across all the, the published data so far. And there are 13,000 of them. Amaze your friends. <laughs> Tell your parents. I know what a low Fosterman Confertus looks like. Um, yeah, so that's command tab. command tab, as opposed to what? Okay, great. Um, yeah, that just shows you a bit more about it. Um, and how about drain pipe data? Uh, this is one that councils actually find quite interesting because they, they're often giving out this data to developers or to, I don't know, um, drain pipe enthusiasts. Um, no, actually, I don't really know who, who uses the data, but apparently they give it out a lot. And Geelong published their drain pipe data shortly before GovHack last year, and they didn't really know what anyone would do with it exactly. Um, but one thing that um, happened to it was a team of developers came down here to Geelong and made an app that uses the drain pipe data to predict where pollution would end up um, if you drop something on the street. So if you dropped a, you know, a coffee cup uh, in the street and it got washed down a stormwater drain, where would it end up? And I mean, it's not rocket science, but being able to do this um, automatically was pretty cool. So there they've clicked on that spot um, and it has traced out the path following the drain pipe network until that coffee cup, say, ends up out in the street, uh, out in the river, uh, in the bay. And this is the kind of app that the Geelong City Council thought, that's cool, that's interesting, we'd like that to exist, we'd like that to be on the web, we'd like people to be more aware of the consequences of their actions, but we're not going to spend $50,000 developing that app. It's not you know, a top priority for us. But, but just by putting out the data, they were able to kind of will that app into being, um, and now they are actually gonna put a little bit of funding into sort of continuing developing development of it. Um, and then there are other councils that are also interested. So, um, you know, another one of the kind of benefits of, of putting out data, they, they, they didn't know exactly what they wanted to happen, they put out the data, something interesting happened. Um, and you can also do things like um, show it on national map. Uh, National App being the aggregator of pretty much all open data that is in spatial formats from across the country at all different levels of government. And here I've come up with a beautifully contrived example where we're going to mash up um, stream data, which I think comes from, I don't even remember anymore, that might be Geoscience Australia, and let's say watercourse areas is from the state government, and land subject to inundation might be, you know, council level data. So you can kind of um, uh, you know, bring these different data sets um, from the different levels of government all in one place, uh, make your own little map um, and show that to you know, uh, whoever that you, you think it's useful for. So that's just kind of an extra benefit for councils in doing this kind of stuff. Um, next up, after you know, trees and bins and so on, um, we're going to have standards for parking restrictions, which are kind of complicated because there's lots of different um, kinds of data that we could be talking about, um, planning applications, parks. Um, there's a lot of interest in an open dog map so a, a map that tells you whether you, whether you can walk your dog uh, in a given area, um, particularly on the coastal um, uh, councils, there's sort of restrictions that change um, by the time of the year. Um, and I think everyone would love a, a good parking app that, that could make use of parking restriction data 
to tell you where you can park and how long you can stay. In fact, there was a great story in the paper just a couple of days ago about um, uh, some, some, some guy, I think he was traveling from overseas, and he went out for a beer and ended up getting like $240 in fines because you know, the, the Sydney parking restriction signs are totally incomprehensible to the average human. Um, so, you know, another kind of problem that uh, an app could solve by using open data. Um, and how we make all this work, um, we, you know, just kind of a, a combined effort between um, people in the council, but also people like us outside the councils that, that have to motivate government to publish their data by doing interesting things with it. So, you know, like the open trees and open bin map and, and you know, trying to bring data into other places where it might be useful. So obviously the better the quality of the data, the easier it is to use it in other kinds of apps or research or data visualization or whatever it is. And then the more interesting things that have been produced, the more motivated the council is to put out the next bunch of data and sort of one of those happy virtual cycles. Um, yeah, so we meet pretty much every Wednesday or two. Um, and yeah, basically it's all good. Are there any questions? Yes, so there's a question at the back. So does someone need to run up a microphone or I can just repeat the question? Uh, just oh. about updates, uh, in theory, how quickly can the data be updated in practice? How good are the councils at actually updating data? It's a, it's a great question, and after Matt enables JavaScript. Um, so how do we enable councils to regularly um, update the data? Well, one thing we're doing is putting out tools for automatic publishing. Um, so most councils have their own internal GIS system that has um, data in various levels of up-to-dateness. Depending on the council, some, like you know, the, the data might be literally updated hourly. You know, they'll go out on site, update the status of a tree, and it automatically updates the database. So then how do we get that um, out onto the web? Um, well, I'm trying to encourage everyone to just develop scripts using OGR to OGR, which is a tool in the GDAL suite of um, geospatial uh, processing tools. And so they can have a script that runs that, which will extract the data out, dump it onto disk, and then using this handy dandy uh, CCAN API based tool, they can basically automatically um, push that up. And the tool um, is really simple to run on the command line like that. Biggest problem I'm having so far is that, you know, I show that to this audience and everyone's like, oh yeah, Python, cool. I show that to a council GIS audience, and they're like, what, Python? Oh, uh, look, um, uh, what do I click on? Uh, yeah, I mean, they kind of get that it's, like, they sort of understand what programming is, but they think it's the thing that some other people do. So trying to somehow make that even easier is the hard bit. Um, but we're working on that at the moment. Um, I'm gonna start with a couple of councils and see if I can find the, the right sort of training or the right approach that makes it understandable. Um, but certainly a couple of councils like Geelong and City of Melbourne are well on, on track to doing the, the automatic publishing thing. Other questions? One more. one more question down the front. Let's hope it's a good one for all this suspense. Thanks for the talk. Um, you touched on it a little bit with the team from Geelong and GovHack, who the council is now helping maintain, perhaps to some extent, yep. this this project. Um, I'm guessing there's a non-zero cost in running servers to maintain each individual maps that you have running. It might start off very cheap, but as you start adding more maps, it builds up. Do the councils chip in at all to help finance these sort of projects? Not so far. Um, so the, the 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 maps that I build uh, are pretty close to to free. I, I tend to host the static HTML on GitHub pages. And the only server cost is, is serving up some of the custom um, tiles. Uh, and I could probably get away with not doing that either. Um, certainly, the longer term, I, I think we'd 
need to find a model where we can just get them all to chip in, you know, a couple hundred dollars a year or something, and, and you could get quite a lot for that, I suspect. Cool.